Good morning and uh, welcome to Sudbury Baptist Church. We come here to worship God. We will be continuing our, our mini-series looking at the book of Habakkuk. And um, if you remember what, what I was saying about Habakkuk last week, well we'll do it, be doing a bit of a recap, but the nation uh, of Israel is in a mess. Habakkuk is crying out to God to move because God doesn't seem to be doing anything. And maybe um, you're in a situation where you feel, I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm praying, and nothing seems to be happening. And well, we'll see in Habakkuk, it's a, a call for us to trust God. And he knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing with our world, with our nation. He knows what he's doing in our lives. And he calls us to live uh, by faith and not by sight. And let's, let's come, shall we, to pray and commit ourselves to the Lord and pray for that faith that will strengthen us and enable us to go through the fiercest storms. Lord Jesus, we worship you. Heavenly Father, we worship you. Blessed Spirit, we worship you. You are our God. Father, you have created us. Jesus, you have redeemed us. Holy Spirit, you are the comforter, the one who comes alongside us to strengthen us, to give us resilience, to weather the storms, and, and to do that with joy. Because, Lord, you promised that all that we're going through is going to make us like Jesus. It's going to conform us to the image of Christ. Lord, we, we pray that as we worship you now, that we might be able to truly lift up our hearts and our lives to you. And that we might receive your strength, receive your power. Oh God, we give you this time and we pray Jesus be glorified in this place. Amen.
themselves, they put themselves at the center. They try to find peace, they try to find happiness, and those things elude them. But you say in your word that the way to find ourselves is to lose ourselves, to give ourselves away, to give ourselves to you. Lord Jesus, you said that in giving ourselves away, giving everything to you, we 
find not just life in abundance for this earth, but we find eternal life as well. And Lord, we give ourselves afresh to you. Lord, we know that even if we have given our lives to you in the past, it's, it's so easy to take things back. And then suddenly we realise that there are things that we, we're holding on to, things that we've taken back, things where you are no longer the owner of those. So we want to give them back to you, Lord Jesus. Just take a few moments. Just think, is there anything you're holding on to that Jesus is saying, I want you to give that to me? Or something that you're holding on to that you say, I want, I want that back. I'm taking it up again. story in the Bible of a, of a merchant who saw a precious pearl. And that pearl represents the kingdom of God. And we're told that he sold everything to get that pearl. He gave everything away for that pearl. It represents the kingdom. It represents you, Jesus. The pearl of great pearl. Lord, we give you our whole lives. Use them for your glory, we pray. Amen. Habakkuk chapter 2. Beginning at verse 4. It's a recap from last week. Habakkuk was having a moan to God. He's complaining about the state of his nation. The nation's in a mess, God, and you're not doing anything about it. We looked at that kind of question. Do you ever feel that God, God's not doing anything? He's, he's not working for you. He's not answering your prayers. And God's response was shocking, unsurprising. And he said to Habakkuk, I'm raising up the Babylonians to judge the nation. Which led to Habakkuk's second complaint. Lord, how can you do that? They're a violent, ruthless people. They're worse than we are. And Habakkuk waited for God to speak and respond to his second complaint. And God's answer was, in a sense, wasn't really an answer. He didn't answer Habakkuk's objections, but he said, look, your job is to get the message out, to tell people the Babylonians are coming and give them an opportunity to repent and get themselves right with me, is in effect what he was saying. And we drew a parallel there um, with our situation as we are called to go out and share the message of Christ in the midst of the storm that's going on. <coughs> to share the gospel, to share the good news. And so we move further on into chapter 2. Now Habakkuk, if someone said to you, do you know the book of Habakkuk? Now, how well do you know it? You'd probably say, most people would say, oh, I don't know it very well at all. Um, I've discovered that if you, if you, often if you look at most people's Bibles, you know you can tell when pages have been read because there's a bit of discoloration down the spine. Um, there's usually discoloration where the Psalms and the Proverbs are, and there's discoloration uh, where the New Testament is, but often there's lots of white <laughs> in other parts. Because um, they haven't been opened. And the minor prophets are probably the most likely candidates to have not been read. Even though you may not know much about Habakkuk, Habakkuk, particularly chapter 2, is extensively quoted in the New Testament. It's quoted by Paul, it's 
quoted by the writer of Hebrews and massive link up with the book of Revelation. And we're going to see some of those links this morning. I hope we're not going to run out of time. So we pick up on chapter 4. See, the enemy, this is Babylon, is puffed up. His desires are not upright. But the righteous person will live by his faithfulness. I, I put in yellow that verse because there's, that's one of the verses that links up with the New Testament. Indeed, wine betrays him. This is the, the enemy. He is arrogant and never at rest because he is as greedy as the grave and like death is never satisfied. He gathers to himself all the nations and takes captive all the peoples. If you think about it, Habakkuk has objected. God, what are you doing sending the Babylonians? And it's almost like he kind of doesn't, he thinks that God doesn't realise how bad they are. And, and here God says, look, I know what they're like. They're puffed up, they're greedy, they're insatiable, they're consuming nations. And he's giving a warning to Habakkuk and he's saying, look, Evil is going to rise. Things are going to get tough for your nation. You know, evil is always present in our world. It might not seem to be active a lot of the times, but it's always there. Remember, we, we learned from John, the whole world is in the grip of the evil one. But sometimes evil <coughs> seems to accelerate. Evil seems to go out of control and get worse and worse and worse. And we, we saw that last century with, with the Holocaust and in Rwanda. And we saw the terrible uh, war that went on in the Balkans. That's genocide. <coughs> comes seemingly sometimes from nowhere. I remember somebody talking about the, the conflict in the Balkans and saying, I didn't understand what happened because the people that began to persecute us were our neighbours and people we thought were friends. But evil rises. And God is saying to Habakkuk, the Babylonians are coming. You need to get ready. So what do we do when conflict arises, when it's there, in yellow, the righteous person will live by his faithfulness. You see, when, when evil is rising, we, we're to pray for revival. We pray for God to revive his church. And we pray for safety, for protection. But what do you do if neither of those things happen? If you're praying and praying and praying and evil is increasing and increasing and increasing, Habakkuk has the answer to live by faithfulness, to be faithful to God in the midst of the storm. If you uh, see other translations, uh, it reads slightly differently. It, the one that I'm reading from says the righteous person will live by his faithfulness. This also translated the righteous person will live by faith. This is the key to living in the midst of turmoil and evil. So which is the right translation? You know, sometimes, you know, you, you read something in the Bible and then you check it with another Bible and you think, oh, it's this it's slightly different. Well, what, what, what's going on there? Well, the word that Habakkuk uses is capable of being understood in more than one way. It has a broad meaning. I mean, we know that from the English language. Sometimes a word can mean multiple things. And interestingly, uh, the Apostle Paul uh, picks up on this in Romans chapter 1. Did you know that this passage in Habakkuk is the bedrock 
of what's many consider to be Paul's greatest letter, the letter to the Romans. And, and in a sense, the whole of Romans is, is like an exposition of this passage in Habakkuk. So Paul was clearly very impressed by it. Listen to what he said in Romans 1. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Paul is saying, faith that the Christian life begins with faith. You know, before I actually became a Christian, before I gave my life to Jesus, there came a moment when what I've heard people saying to me, when I people have been evangelizing me, and I remember thinking it was all rubbish, there came a moment when I suddenly thought, I, I don't know why, but I believe this. I believe what they're saying. It's, it's, it sounds true. So faith was the very beginning. And then I gave my life to Jesus as a response. So it's by faith from first to last. But we're then called to live by faith. Because sometimes um, things can come along which, which shake us as Christians. And we need to remind ourselves that it, it's all by faith. It can be translated from faith to faith. And Paul's idea of faith is not just an intellectual assent, not just saying, yes, I believe Jesus is Lord, but it's, it's about living a life that is full of faith. So when you are full of faith, you are faithful to God. And that, uh, and that captures something of what, of what Habakkuk's saying and with the word that he's using. Be full of faith and be faithful to God and you will live, he says. Never let go of God. And did you know the writer to the Hebrews also quoted this great passage different context but the many of the early Christians were originally Jewish people who come to see that Jesus was the Messiah and they started worshipping Jesus and they experienced intense persecution from their own people who tried to turn them back to turn them away from Jesus back to the old way of doing things and the writer to the Hebrews is speaking to Jewish Christians and telling them to not turn back. Listen to what he says. You need to persevere so that when you've done the will of God, you will receive what he's promised. For in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one will live by faith. There's Habakkuk. And I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. He says, look, we mustn't turn back from this gospel that we've heard. And then he says with confidence, but we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. And he looked at these people who'd suffered for Christ and he could say to you, yeah, but you're not going to turn back, are you? You're going to stay faithful. But there is the call. The context is different to Habakkuk. The persecution is different. But the message is the same. See, when temptation comes, when tribulation comes, when difficulty comes, there is always a temptation to turn away from Jesus and think, where's God? God doesn't seem to be answering my prayers. He doesn't seem to be doing anything. What's the point in believing in Jesus? My prayers are hitting the ceiling. And, and Habakkuk and Paul and Hebrews say, ah, oh, Keep your faith, keep the faith, keep faithful, keep going, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. So that's the call to the people of Israel in the book of Habakkuk. Be faithful to God. 
don't fear those who drift away. So the second part of the chapter, if the first part is a call to the righteous to be faithful, the second part is about what, what's going to happen to Babylon. What about this monster, Babylon? This enemy who is puffed up with a sense of his own importance. This evil empire that seems so powerful and unstoppable. And evil often does seem unstoppable. It strikes fear into the heart of people to intimidate them, to shake them. Evil is like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. But what Habakkuk tells us is, make no mistake, evil will be stopped. It will be vanquished. And he goes on to say, one day this monstrous empire that everyone fears will be the object of taunt. If you're a, if you're a football fan, you know that they have, they have taunts, don't they, in the matches, often using uh, colourful language about what's going to happen to the other side. I wouldn't dare repeat some of those things that they say. But Habakkuk says, through the Spirit of God, they're going to be ridiculed, they're going to be scorned. And we're just going to read through this fairly quickly, but there are five woes that are pronounced upon Babylon. Woe means, alas, it's not in the modern sense of world. Okay, it's a woe to you. Five taunts. But what you will see, if you were, we're not going to spend a huge amount of time looking at them, is you'll see there is a spiritual principle at work, and it's this. You reap what you sow. As you have done to others, so it will be done to you. And these woes are like, you did this, but that's going to happen to you. This monster is going to be tamed and defeated. So we're just going to quickly go through these woes. Woe to him who piles up stolen goods and makes himself wealthy by extortion. How long must this go on? Will not your creditors suddenly arise? Will they not wake up and make you tremble? Then you will become their prey. Because you have plundered many nations, the people who are left will plunder you. For you have shed human blood, you have destroyed lands and cities and everyone in them. So you have exploited people. And you have taken all their money, but you are going to be left with nothing. We sang that song here at the beginning of the part of the service, I give myself away. And saying that, you know, the spiritual principle is the first should be last and the last should be first. Second woe, woe to him who builds his house by unjust gain, setting his nest on high to escape the clutches of ruin. You've plotted the ruin of many people, shaming your own house and forfeiting your life. The stones of the wall will cry out and the beams of the woodwork will echo in. You've built your nest by unjust gain. You've plotted the ruin of others. But they're crying out to you. Reminiscent of the book of James as well, isn't it? The wages that you've withheld from the poor are crying out to you. Third word. Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and establishes a town by injustice. Has not the Lord Almighty determined that the people's labour is only fuel for the fire, that the nations exhaust themselves for nothing? For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That's a famous verse, isn't it? It's a, a wonderful verse. It's something that's often quoted, but we don't often think about the context. It's spoken in the context of a woe against an immoral nation, against an unjust nation. It says cities can be built with bloodshed and injustice. 
If you go back to the Tower of Babel, built by the Babylonians, the word Babel and Babylonian, it's the same root words. The Babylonians were the first people who built a tower. They wanted to build it to the heavens to make a name for themselves. And God had to come down and humble them. There's that pride again, that pride that we just read in the earlier part of Habakkuk. But all that pride, all that building a city with bloodshed and establishing it by injustice is pointless. There's no point in amassing power on earth and through exploiting other people. You might think you're on the winning side. You might think you've got one over on other people, on weaker people. But you're exhausting yourself for nothing, it says, because the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. It's futile to try and do something against the purposes of God. God will establish justice and righteousness, it will happen. This is the future that we're seeing. Global warming will be gone. Pollution will be gone. You won't need to worry about whether you can put paper in your recycling bin or not. It'll be cleaned up. Sickness and suffering will be gone. Warfare will be gone. Everything will be made new. The earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord. The fourth woe. Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbours, pouring it from the wineskin till they are drunk, so that he can gaze on their naked bodies. You will be filled with shame instead of glory. Now it's your turn. Drink and let your nakedness be exposed. The cup from the Lord's right hand is coming around to you and disgrace will cover your glory. The violence you've done to Lebanon will overwhelm you and your destruction of animals will terrify you for you have shed human blood and you have destroyed lands and cities and everyone in them. There's that principle. They reap what they sow. And the fifth word of what of what value is an idol carved by a craftsman or an image that teaches lies? For the one who makes it trusts in his own creation. He makes idols that cannot speak. Woe to him who says to wood, come to life or to lifeless stone. Wake up. Can it give guidance? It's covered with gold and silver. There's no breath in it. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. And people make idols of wood and stone and precious metal. And they say, that's our God. And they bow down before them. And we have our own idols. Maybe we're a bit more sophisticated. But we put our trust in the things of this world. But these but Habakkuk saying to them, look, because we know, as I was saying last week, many people in Israel turned away from the God of heaven and followed the gods of the other nations. They said, what's the point? They're just lifeless. They can't speak a word. They are silent before you. By contrast, God is real. God is in his temple. And the earth will be silent before him. Do you see that reversal there? They cannot speak. So five, five woes. The judgment on Babylon will be comprehensive and final. The one who oppressed the nations will be no more. So God is sending the Babylonians to judge his people. The message is urgent. They need to turn from their sins and be faithful to God, and they will live. But in the end, 
Babylon will fall, evil will be defeated, the righteous person will live by his faithfulness and will get through the time of testing. That's Habakkuk's message to the people then. But there is also a message to us in 21st century Britain. We too are called to be faithful in the midst of evil. I said at the beginning that there, there is a strong connection with the book of Revelation. Babylon, the Babylon who invaded Israel as a nation is no more but it becomes a symbol of the world in opposition to God. Did you know three chapters, almost three whole chapters, I think it's two and a half chapters are, of Revelation are devoted to Babylon and its fall. You're, of course, you're all experts on Revelation because we, we studied this during lockdown and just afterwards. I don't know if you remember, but uh, I put this picture up and uh, this was an artist's impression of the image in chapter 17 of Revelation. Babylon is likened to a blasphemous prostitute riding on the beast. She gets drunk on the blood of the saints and, and there was a notice we saw Babylon the Great the mother of prostitutes of the abominations of the church of, of the earth the mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. does this, this seem at all familiar maybe it does maybe it doesn't but maybe you want to go away after the service and read chapter 17 18 and 19 of Revelation there's Babylon's there and in the midst of that terrible, terrible picture of evil, just like the picture in Habakkuk of evil, the church this time is called to be faithful. Then I heard a voice from heaven say, come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues. And we as the people of God, are called sometimes to step away from the values of the world around us so that we don't share in the judgment when it comes. It's so easy to compromise. It's so easy to go with the flow. Much harder to take a stand and say, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to go that way. I was saying to, I was saying to someone before the service, I wasn't going to say this, but... Um, you know, we, we live in a, in a corrupt world system and um, many, many, many years ago in a, in a former life, I, I worked for Barclays Bank and uh, I was on the lowest rung. I was there as a kind of a college student getting work experience and uh, they said to me one day, Graham, we want you to take the post to the post office. Uh, in the centre of town, and they said, and, uh, you know, check your mileage, because you can claim back mileage. So I said, okay, so I've got the post, I drive to the post office, I came back, and they said, oh, now you've got to fill out a claim form, and I put the claim form uh, trip to the post office two miles. And they said to me, no, you've made a mistake, it's not two miles, it's four miles. And I said, no, it's two miles, because I, I measured it on the mileometer on my car. They said, no, it's four miles. And I said, no, it's definitely two miles. <laughs> and they said, but we all claim for four miles, okay? <laughs> it was a choice. They would not accept my mileage claim, the two miles are. And I said, oh, that's fine, I'll just claim every other trip then. But they were angry with me. Oh, it's a very small thing. It's a very trivial thing. But we are called to live differently to the world around us, to a world that's grabbing, a world that's dishonest, a world that's out to deceive people and to get what it can for itself. We're called to come out of that, to not be corrupted by that. Come out of her, my people. 
So it's the same message, be faithful. And there is a threefold woe. So I've got an extra slide if you don't need that one. We're not going to look at these in any detail because time will run out. But if you remember, there were five woes in the book of Habakkuk on the, the Babylonian Empire. There are three sets of woes repeated twice against Babylon in the book of Revelation. I wonder whether he was thinking about um, Habakkuk. Uh, you know, one of the, one of the things about, about Revelation, which is, it's, it's an utterly extraordinary book, it, and, it's, and it's clearly uh, something that, that John has very uh, painstakingly crafted. And there are probably more references to the Old Testament in the book of Revelation than any other book in the New Testament. Nearly everything. You can find a link back in one way or another. And John, is, John has been there on his, on his island of Patmos. He's been exiled. He's had these, these great visions and he's trying to put them into words. And he puts them into words using scripture. It's an extraordinary um, creation. It's so highly and uh, cleverly crafted. And I wonder whether he was, he was thinking of Hamakakil. And he says, whoa, whoa to you great city. You mighty city of Babylon in one hour. Your doom has come. And he repeats that phrase as well three times in one hour. This evil that seems out of control, that seems unstoppable, when God speaks, it just takes an hour. In one hour, your doom has come. Woe, woe to you, great city, dressed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. In one hour, such great wealth has been brought to ruin. Woe! Woe to you, great city, where all who had ships on the sea become rich through her wealth. In one hour, she has been brought to ruin. So there's the woes. And as Christians, John says to us, rejoice over her, you heavens. Rejoice, you people of God. Rejoice apostles and prophets, for God has judged her with the judgment she imposed on you. Because these people were getting rich through unjust gain. They were exploiting the poor. The rich were getting richer. The poor are getting poorer. The differential between rich and poor is growing bigger and bigger and bigger. As we, we saw that through COVID, that, that many people were plunged into poverty and yet there were more billionaires created during COVID than, than was, you could imagine. But it's going to fall. Rejoice. And then we read the final word on Babylon. You know, empires rise and fall. Babylon fell after Habakkuk. But that gave way to another empire, which was pretty much the same. And another empire, and then Rome came along, and, and they exploited people. They were like the monster again. And then empires have grown up throughout history, and they've gone out into the world, and they've caused devastation and poverty, and they've exploited people. And the history of the world, in many ways, is the history of empires getting rich at the expense of others. But one day, when the final great empire, Babylon, is judged, it's going to be permanent. As we read in chapter 18, then a mighty angel picked up a boulder the size of a large millstone, threw it into the sea, and said, with such violence, the great city of Babylon will be thrown down, never to be found again. The last empire will fall before the coming of the kingdom of God. The earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord as the waters 
Hapa. The same. It will happen. It's certain. And if we had more time, we could unpack the rest of um, the book of Revelation. It looks at the future and it talks about it. Hallelujah is repeated. After this, after evil is defeated, I saw what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven, shouting, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for just and true are his judgments. He's condemned the great prostitute, he's corrupted the earth by her adulteries. He's avenged on her the blood of his servants. And uh, we're not going to read all this now, but you, keep, you go through that chapter and there's hallelujah, hallelujah again. People are falling down. And, and it goes through again. Hallelujah, hallelujah. For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Evil will at be totally and completely and finally defeated at the coming of Christ. And you need to read Revelation 19 to get all those hallelujahs into your head. But I wanted to look at that last hallelujah. As we find hallelujah for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean was given to her to wear. And the angel says, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. There's a wedding. The wedding not just of the year, of the decade, of the century. The wedding to outdo all weddings. It's coming at the end of history. Whatever storm we're going through, whatever storm the world is going through, God is on the throne. God is with us, his people. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. We may be fortunate enough to live in times of peace. We may live to see revival in our nation, or we may live in troubled times. But whatever the time, the call of Habakkuk, and the call of Paul, and the call of Hebrews, and the call of Revelation, is to hold on to God, to be faithful, to have faith in the midst of the tribulation and suffering. And when the world around us is turning away from God and from his values, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Evil may come for a season, but in the end it will be crushed. Babylon will fall, and that fall will usher in the kingdom. So there's a wedding invitation. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. You're all invited to this wedding, but you have to reply to the invitation. You know, I've been to a few weddings in this church where people haven't replied to the invitation. But well, they've turned up at the reception, demanding to be let in. And the hosts have said, but you didn't reply. I didn't think I needed to. I'm family. <laughs> and people have very graciously kind of squeezed them in. Um, but God won't squeeze anybody in if you haven't replied. If you haven't said, yes, Lord Jesus. I believe in you. I give my life to you. I want to be faithful to you. I want to live for your glory. You have to accept the invitation. And if you're here this morning, or if you're here watching this online, and you haven't accepted that, do it now. Give your life to Jesus.
We sang earlier, I give myself away. Give your life to Jesus. Because the wedding's going to be great. Let's pray. Well, we thank you for this message from Habakkuk. When you first look at Habakkuk, when you read that first chapter, it's quite scary. You wonder what's going on. And maybe we don't understand all of it. But we can hear that call to be faithful. The righteous will live by faith. The righteous will live by faithfulness. Well, I pray if there's any here this morning or any watching who haven't given their life to Jesus just just now, say, Jesus, I, I accept your invitation. Give my life to you. The Holy Spirit is convicting you. You know God is speaking to you. Don't, don't push him away. But respond to him. Give your life to Jesus. Begin the journey of faith. I pray, Lord, for the church. I pray if there are any here in the church today who've wandered away a bit, who are aware of areas in their lives where they're not, they're not being faithful. Maybe they've compromised in some way, or they've drifted a bit away from you. Jesus is saying, come back. Don't drift away. Renew your faith. And Lord Jesus, we pray that in the midst of the storm, we would keep our eyes fixed upon you. And we would know your faithfulness to us as we are faithful to you. And Lord, we look forward to that day when the kingdom of this world becomes the kingdom of our God, when the earth is filled with the glory of God as the waters cover the sea.